They came from nothing. They were country bumpkins. They came from the poorest part of Arkansas. 20% unemployment, 50% unemployment for black teenagers. They created an empire. Chris, damn it! New Jack City. This place is like no place else. It was the murder capital of America for a long time. They created this new economy. Good $10 boulder crack, sold out back door. There was the recruitment of young individuals. It was almost another form of slavery. These guys had crack commandments. It's not the Godfather, but it's pretty, pretty damn close. That was their way to chase and achieve the American dream. The Chambers Brothers, one American gangster. cold spring morning in Detroit, 1988. The family business known simply as the Chambers Brothers came to a quiet end. Approximately 300 crack and cocaine houses in Detroit, which investigators have linked to the Chambers Organization. Five and a half million dollars in cash at the Detroit airport. You can't run that without using violence as a regular business tool. Bad inner city violence. They were all short in stature, but large in the streets. Billy Joe the charming hustler, Willie, the straight man, Otis, young and impulsive, the oldest, Larry, was the most feared, a lifelong criminal, he killed a cop when he was just 19 years old. He was a scarier dude, he was real scary. In 2003, he wrote a letter from his prison cell to the original street bible, Don Diva. It was never my intention to become a drug dealer. I could never imagine myself being involved in this kind of business. He and his brother Billy Joe became titans of industry in the drug trade. They even instituted a crack house business code, a list of 17 rules and fines for breaking them. Handwritten by Larry, the crack commandments included stealing among the group $300, revealing secrets about the organization $500, speeding while dropping off or picking up $100, and you were on call 24 hours. These guys were very smart and very visionary about how to control a criminal enterprise. If you are planning on getting rich, forget about your girlfriends and family. Your success is going to depend on how well you follow instructions. If you crossed a guy or you know broke one of the rules, you'd have to pay with your life or maybe a missing limb. I recall in particular one person who was alleged to have used a baseball bat or a Louisville slugger. With an army of teenagers working an estimated 300 crack houses, the Chambers brothers were making untold millions, running the largest crack ring in U.S. history at the time of their arrest. I had plenty of time to escape, but I stayed in the game too long. That's my fault. What really exploded it was actually a little video that they did, the DA caught. Money, money, money! We risk. The guys were on there um, bragging about how successful they were, that they were making so much money. I do recall that they were talking about to give the dollars, the, the single dollar bills, to the poor people. See, we throw these ones away, man, since we got $500,000. Well, I'll tell you what we can do. We can give it to the poor. That's exactly what I said, too. We'll just donate those to the poor. As a matter of fact, we just ride down the street and get them ones away. I mean, this, this whole media thing, that's, you know, that quick second flash, and it went first local, and then it blew up. Now their stupidity and bravado will lead to their demise. Chris Hansen, Channel 7 Action News, reporting. They had been written about in newspapers across the country, been on network television, been on local television. I mean, this, this really got a lot of attention. On March 1st, 1988, the federal government charged the brothers and several associates, including Larry's girlfriend, Belinda Lumpkin, in a 15-count indictment. Charges included conspiracy to sell cocaine and supervising a criminal enterprise. Money, money, money! They showed the tapes during the news, even right before the arraignment or the day of the arraignment, just some snippets of the tape. And my initial thought were we knew that we had some problems. An incredible arrogance that led them to make the four Chambers own brothers who have a reputation of being epidemic threatened to they destroy are. an entire generation. We thought that it was going to be almost impossible to select a jury that had not 
heard of or was not aware of some of the publicity. While the chamber's defense argued to have the trial moved out of Detroit. And now, delegates and honored guests. The rest of the nation heard the story from a young governor giving the nominating speech at the Democratic National Convention. A few weeks ago, the police in Detroit, Michigan, broke a huge crack ring. And I'm sorry to say, the ring was being run by two people from my state. They came from the poorest part of Arkansas, and they had brought over 100 young men up there to help them peddle dope in the big cities. <laughs> it was really something to see, you know, that this case had made it into the nomination speech, you know, at the Democratic Convention. I mean, it just shows how these guys from Arkansas got the nation's attention. At the time, the Chambers brothers were quite possibly better known than a young Bill Clinton. Clinton would become famous as the man from Hope, Arkansas. The Chambers brothers came from a place not too far away, Lee County, about an hour southwest of Memphis, Tennessee. It's the Mississippi Delta. The lack of electricity and the lack of plumbing. That's where these kids are coming from. For the Chambers, home movies were family tradition. I was born in LaGrange, Arkansas. This town had a population of around 250. Larry was the second of 14 children. His parents were sharecroppers who hustled their neighbors to keep food on the table. Opportunities for blacks back then were scarce. It was racism and poverty that drove me into the world of crime. In 1970, Lee County was one of the poorest places in all of America. More than half of its residents lived under the poverty line. Unemployment hovered at 25%. As governor of Arkansas, Clinton helped produce a 186-page report on poverty in the Delta. He noted infant mortality rates comparable to a third world nation and famously said Arkansas might get more federal aid if it were a foreign country. Conditions are so poor, so bad that those kids will do anything to get out of those conditions. Historically, then this has always been about money. You know, you, you go up north to make money. Money, money, money. At the height of their reign, it's estimated the Chambers brothers made more money in a single year selling crack than Chrysler made selling cars. Their improbable rise from the Delta to become the crack pimps of Detroit had a direct influence on black America. This, they were different, man. They were really into extravagance. Those guys were making a lot of money, a lot of money. That's where New Jack City began in my eyes. From film to fashion to gangster rap, the seeds can be traced to the chambers. But those guys, they were serious, they were serious players. If you look beyond the obvious poverty, there's a very gothic beauty to Detroit. I always said that. It's a ghost town. It's the birthplace of the American automobile and organized labor. But for years, it had the highest unemployment rate of any American city. One third of its people lived below the poverty line. This is a blue collar city, a working class environment here. And so when the auto industry goes down, this city really takes, uh, it's not crippled, it's, it's just laid out flat. And that's why I think it's so strong that you have such a vibrant underworld and underground economy, which I call the third city, of course. Third city is where um, the denizens uh, who are not respected as citizens flourish. And this is where they move and, and live. Larry Chambers escaped from two county jails in one state prison before he arrived in Detroit's third city in 1985. When I arrived in Detroit, I already had several brothers and sisters there. Nearly everyone that I encountered seemed to be involved with drugs. But the Chambers family did not leave the Delta to sell crack. They did what millions of southern black men and women had done before them. 
If you look through the history of many Detroiters, you would find that people have come to Detroit from somewhere else, seeking a better life. The Motor City held opportunity. That had everything to do with that migration from the South to Detroit, Michigan. It was stable. We're making cars, you know, and everybody needs to drive. You could get an excellent job with no skills. All you had to have was the right attitude. And you got into these auto plants and you made money and you could buy that Ford or that Oldsmobile. And you could even buy a house. You had the most wealthiest black per capita living in Detroit, Michigan because of the auto industry. You know, it was, it was more affluent than Harlem, actually. That affluence fueled a wellspring of black expression. C.L. Franklin ran this tremendously successful church. Before Dr. King came out, uh, he used to make records. I mean, C.L. Franklin's sermons were as famous as anything King had done in their day. And then he had his daughter there, a 14-year-old girl, at one point making a record. Aretha Franklin would become the Queen of Soul, just miles away from Barry Gordy Jr.'s Motown. Detroit was one of those vital, just like Chicago, just like Harlem, it was one of those bellwether places where the industrial engine of, of America and black aspirations had met. Many of those dreams began to slip away the night of July 23, 1967. Detroit police raided an after-hours drinking club where a party was being thrown for two returning Vietnam veterans. It erupted into the worst riot in American history. In five days of fighting, 43 people were killed, 7,000 arrests were made, mostly of young black men. Looting, murder, and arson have nothing to do with civil rights. They are criminal conduct. That's one of the first times the National Guard was called out in an urban area. Can you imagine seeing tanks and, and guys with, with, in, in full riot gear? I mean, it was a war. I think the riots took everybody by surprise because people were working. There were jobs there. So when this thing happened, it was like, what? Here? In fact, Detroit could not keep pace with the spectacular growth of the black community. Affordable housing was hard to find. And unfair lending practices by banks kept many black families out of white neighborhoods. This is an issue both of class and race. It was the haves against the have-nots. There was a lot of black people who weren't working. The big three automakers, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, were moving away from the black community. In the two decades before the riots, they had built 25 new plants in suburban areas outside the city. After those riots, after the National Guard was there, Detroit had changed completely, for the worse. While whites fled the city for jobs in the suburbs, Detroit elected its first African-American mayor, Coleman Young. Like so many of these black mayors, it was, you know, they're the captain of the Titanic. The state as a whole didn't have a vested interest in keeping a feisty black mayor afloat. Why should we? It's isolation from everyone and everything else in the Midwest. Detroit, in this region, is the most segregated in the United States. All of this feeds into the, the, the world that the Chambers brothers enter. By the time the Chambers arrived, Detroit was the urban equivalent of Lee County, Arkansas, mostly black and mostly poor. Detroit was not simply um, another urban city. It had a, a mystique that goes back to 67 of, of real fear. Detroit was not a city where people just rolled in there and took over. And yet, that's exactly what the Chambers brothers did. Willie Chambers was a postman in Detroit who had saved a little money. In 1982, he and Billy Joe bought a store on the corner of St. Clair in Kircherville. These guys had a great work ethic. And they started off with a little party store there, and they were, you know, okay. And they applied that they were hungry. 
in Detroit, the party stores is always your liquor stores where you can get your liquor and your alcohol and your, your beer and wine. You gravitated to the, the party stores because that's where people hung out. People would maybe drink and be in the parking lots talking, joking, whatever. BJ, as he would have become known, was a natural born hustler who began selling weed over the counter. The reason they got in, I think, at the street level, is because most of the homegrown boys here were laughing. Those are country guys. We had that prejudice. People didn't probably didn't take them seriously. They, they were country bumpkins. And they were like, okay, we'll be that. You know, just give us our money. BJ met a girl, bought a house, had a son, and then crack came to town. This is a city that had more guns than residents. That's the starting point. And then you put crack cocaine into this mix, and it was explosive. Before the fall of 1983, Larry Chambers had never even heard of crack. Five years later, he and his brothers were demonized across America as the faces of an inner city epidemic, and with good reason. It wasn't a fly-by-night organization. These guys had actually studied, you know, the blueprint of GM and the big three automakers to really design what they were doing. According to Larry, they had a lot of help. We had over eight Detroit police officers working for us. We also had bankers, renowned preachers, Insurance companies, credit unions, real estate companies, welfare agents, board of education members, lawyers, doctors, and car dealers on our payroll. As the big three automakers laid off workers and shut down plants, the Chambers brothers built an empire using underage labor. I had 20 young girls whose job it was to cut cocaine into crack rocks. You use younger people because they're much more difficult to prosecute. That's what they found out. <laughs> With crack and the influx of that whole drug economy, it was, um, this is our industry. This is our time now. The criminal enterprise run by four brothers from the backwaters of Arkansas became a prime target in America's war on drugs. It was getting the attention of the Department of Justice. It really was. I mean, they were really scratching their heads trying to figure out what to do about this. Authorities began raiding their houses. I think that anybody who believes that there, A, was ever a war on drugs, or B, thinks that someone is winning a war on drugs, is probably delusional. If you really want to win a war, if you really want to stop the narcotics trade, why would you wait until the drugs have reached the inner city and gotten into, say, 100 houses versus making the stop at the border? when you can get all of them, and it never gets to those 100 houses. The efforts to stop the narcotics should never be in the inner city. They should be on the border. But I think that no one wants to really control our borders, despite the politicians' words to the contrary. In fact, the U.S. government had taken steps to stop the flow of cocaine into the country. That may have inadvertently fueled this new crack economy. Colombia is the country most associated with cocaine. Although the coca plant flourishes in Peru and Bolivia, the leaves produce a paste. Powder cocaine is made by processing this paste with a chemical, usually ether. In 1982, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency began Operation ChemCon or chemical control. Federal agents began intercepting large shipments of ether into South America in hopes of curbing cocaine production. We're as much a part of the problem as Colombia and Peru and Bolivia because we provide many of the chemicals that go into the processing of this poison. American companies profit from it. The Colombian government had already cut off imports of ether. In response, the Medellin cartel, Colombia's most notorious drug ring, began moving large quantities of coca paste to its bases in the Caribbean. 
Throughout the West Indies and the Bahamas, base rock began to appear. A pebble-like concoction of coca paste, baking soda, water, and rum. With the new base rock coming out of the Caribbean, cocaine found an avenue into the neighborhood. When they invented crack cocaine, they found a way to bring the price down because they then found the ability to create the quantity. A kilo of cocaine could be converted into thousands of tiny rocks. In the city of Detroit, it was not hard to get a hold of a kilo of cocaine if you knew the right people to talk to, and it seems that many people did. In the summer of 1984, crack came to Detroit on the corner of St. Clair and Kerchival. The uncle of Billy Joe's girlfriend claimed he could turn $2,500 of coke into 10 grand in 48 hours. Billy Joe loaned him the money. By the 4th of July, BJ had converted his weed house into a crack house. By the fall, the name BJ meant crack in the Motor City. Then, his big brother Larry moved to town. You say their name, say Chambers are looking for you, hey, they gone, they running, they be scared, you know. They, you know, they will kill you in a minute with no hesitation. Within a few months, I had a little over 30 crack houses, 150 workers, and grossing over $200,000 per week. I can't turn back. I'm addicted to the money. One morning I got up and looked at the skyline. It's not New York, it's not LA, but it's definitely a city that can't be ignored. I knew that this story was, was different and it had to have a name for it that was different. And that was it, New Jack City. In 1986, writer Barry Michael Cooper spent time observing the drug trade in Detroit with criminologist Dr. Carl Taylor. Some of their marketing, in my opinion, is, is as good as uh, Madison Avenue. We showed him around and gave him the history of what was taking place here. Detroit boys were known as more as players, you know, like pimps and so forth. We had all these great street guys who weren't selling drugs, who were just out here being real pimps, the original pimps. What changed, what got ugly is when dope came in. At the time, Larry Chambers and his little brother Billy Joe were the biggest crack pimps in the Motor City. Cooper described his experience in an article for the Village Voice entitled, Kids Killing Kids, New Jack City Eats Its Young. Barry Michael Cooper came in here and was able to legitimize what I had been screaming as a researcher, that it's here. This is it here. This is a whole different, this is a whole new paradigm. That's where New Jack City began in my eye. Cooper's research led to a film project starring Wesley Snipes. New Jack City has this whole thing about the, the Carter in the film, where they control this building and do other... That, the Chambers brothers did, had their own Carter. The Broadmoor was Larry's idea. Because of my huge crack clientele, I had to buy huge apartment buildings just to absorb or minimize the traffic flow. On many occasions, there were long lines of people standing on the streets waiting for their turn to purchase crack. The apartment building that became his one-stop shop is now just a field off Grand Boulevard. There were still people living there. You know, and they would just, you know, today we're selling from here, and they would move in on a mother and her family and sell, and the mother couldn't do anything about it. The product was priced by floor. $5 rocks on one, $10 rocks on two. There were rooms for smoking crack and rooms for prostitution. They were resourceful. They were opportunistic. They recognized the market and advantaged the market and then outcompeted everybody. They handled their business almost like a distributorship. It's like pizza pizza, except it was dope dope. Just say no. As the first lady spread her famous catchphrase, the Chambers brothers bought property throughout Detroit. They would find a, a street where they thought that, that it would be good for a crack house, and if someone else had a crack house there, they would put theirs next door and give, give two for one. 
They go into the schools and hand them out to the kids, and hand them out to the kids in the neighborhood. They're just handwritten greeting cards. Here, good $10 boulder crack, sold out back door. Eventually, the brothers even began competing against each other. In May of 1986, Otis Chambers graduated from Mariana High School and joined his brothers in Detroit. He wasn't alone. People were being recruited from Arkansas to come up and work in the organization in Detroit. The kids from Mariana, they didn't have any cash on them, so they couldn't even go anywhere. And they didn't know where they were once they walked out into the street. They couldn't find their way around. When my research guys started talking about it, yo, man, they're bringing these kids from the South. It was almost another form of slavery, all of the above. They were pulling things on those kids from the South that they couldn't pull on the kids up here, but it worked. That's what made them very successful. They had a lot of crack houses. They brought about a new type of game. The family business grew into a multi-million dollar enterprise before the authorities knew anything about it. By the time we stumbled across it, it was just huge at that point. You know, we were the government. It takes a little while for us to realize that we're tripping over something every day. The same month Otis moved to Motown, U.S. Drug Enforcement officials met in D.C. The special agent from Detroit opened the meeting, saying his city was overrun by crack. Exactly one month later, the number one pick of the NBA draft was found dead with cocaine in his system, two days after being chosen by the Boston Celtics. No one knows why yet. There are reports that traces of cocaine... It, it hit us hard because it was my field. Young men that I was coaching were only a few years younger than him. And so you immediately tried to use something like that as a form of education to talk to your guys and educate them to, you know, what could happen. What happened to Len Bias happened again eight days later. to be married today. Instead, they're here now to console a grieving family. Another young, fit athlete, Don Rogers, defensive back for the Cleveland Browns, was found dead with cocaine in his system. It's like the Lenny Bias thing, you know, no one knows how long he's been doing it or... How many times they did it? By August, the Detroit Police Department and the DEA had formed the No Crack Task Force. They even arrested Billy Joe twice without ever realizing who he was. We were charging these guys under state charges. They were not major charges from the perspective of Wayne County. So they were going out. possible all of the equipment the personnel the plans anything they have that could be used in this war against drugs in the fall of 1986 lawmakers on capitol hill began debating new tougher sentencing laws for drug offenses while the federal agent in detroit began figuring out the family connection on raids we would find you know, uh, calendars from Mariana, Arkansas. We'd find letters addressed to them from Mariana. I stumbled on some things, and I said, guys, I think this is, I think this is all connected. Then there was this one drug raid where these guys get in the house, they start searching around, and they find all these videotapes. And there's another tape, and another tape, and another tape, and they're doing tours of their homes. This is the dining room. Excuse me, this is the living room, not the dining room. This is a 24 carat gold faucet. <laughs> we would come back from a raid and we would just put it on a TV and then just roll it all the way through because there would be family picnics and things like that on it. And then we'd cut from the family picnic to counting the money. Money, money, money. We risk, damn it. And before long, you know, they had this family tree this anatomy of a drug game. On July 27, 1987, the city of Detroit was given a name to blame for its crack nightmare. They are called the Chambers family. Detroit and federal narcotics agents have been piecing together a family tree. Incredible arrogance that led them to make their own home television videotape movies. But no matter how rich and powerful the Chambers may be, their dynasty is starting to fall. On Detroit's east side, I'm Chris Hansen, Channel 7 Action News, reporting. I knew that it would have impact. 
but I wasn't prepared for the reaction. Money, money, money. Is that going to be on that tape, what I just said? Everything you can say. A lot of people were saying, how stupid. Why would you videotape that and then let it fall into the hands of the police? But in the street, in the third city, that was like a video of Prince or somebody. And the kids selectively heard what they wanted. What did they hear? Money, money, money. We rich, damn it. That was very powerful. I definitely remember that tape. I mean, at that time, I was high school coach. I was dealing with that unfortunate age that they were recruiting as sellers, runners, whatever. And, and, and unfortunately, I did lose some young men uh, that went that route. New shipment will be coming in at 60. 30. Exactly. Oh, yeah. That's what time I'm going to be By the time the tapes aired, a federal grand jury was already hearing the case against the Chambers brothers. Those things went on the air, and I said, guys, that's going to screw up that evidence. But I think maybe the people of the city of Detroit needed to see that, that somebody was really trying to do something. <laughs> yeah. Police officer, search warrant! One of the Chambers brothers' last locations was a rundown hotel a block away from the Detroit Metro Airport. They'd taken over the entire second floor. You'd think they could have gotten hold of enough cash to just, you know, check out and live somewhere. I don't know. Canada was just across the river. But the brothers chose not to run. took him to the precinct. I said, Billy, this is not a state charge. This is a federal charge. And uh, I remember he was sitting on a desk and his feet were swinging from there. He's just a little guy. And uh, he said, well, what am I looking at? And I said, life, Billy. Looking at life. They came from the poorest part of Arkansas and they had brought over 100 young men up there to help them pedal dope in the big city. When I think of that county they came from, 20% unemployment, 50% unemployment for black teenagers. It's not enough just to say no to drugs. These kids have to be able to say yes to life. They have to be able to say yes to life. Well, you know, they come from right down where Walmart started. I mean, I think if these guys had taken the skills that they had, put that into a legitimate business uh, environment, and, and you could be successful. I hear that a lot. In America, I imagine Al Capone could have been a businessman. I'm not certain that I always agree that they could have been that because there's another type of discipline. The ruthlessness that we see in corporate America is a little different. We don't take people out in the parking lot and literally blow their brains out. There were several allegations of acts of enforcement. One witness in particular I recall to this day testifying that uh, it was alleged that a gun was put to her head at one point in time and she actually urinated on herself because she thought she was about to be killed. They did seize or they did recover what they considered to be rules from some of the houses. How you operated the crack house and how you handled the crack, how you sold it. Once you saw these rules, you knew that this was a franchise operation, right? This wasn't the Ma and Pa diner. I mean, this was the McDonald's of crack cocaine operations in Detroit. They had it down to a system. We go to Biggie Small years later, the Ten Crack Commandments. Well, these guys had, the Chambers with them, had Crack Commandments. It's not the Godfather, but it's pretty, pretty damn close. On October 28, 1988, the Chambers brothers and five of their associates, including Larry's girlfriend, were convicted on conspiracy and drug charges. This case was also around the time of the beginning of the sentencing guidelines, which meant what we commonly refer to as basketball sentences, because the numbers are so high. Uh, you're talking about sometimes 30 years, 60 years that a person is given, and that's similar to a basketball score. My brother BJ, who taught me many things concerning the drug game, received 50 years, but it got reduced to 27. Otis also received 27 years. Willie got 21. Only Larry got put away for life. My lady friend Belinda Lumpkin was sentenced to 25 years for threatening a government witness, which was false. After serving 12 years in prison, 
former President Bill Clinton gave her a pardon. The first house raided by police in the Chambers case is on Gray Street. It's still standing, but just barely. You know, the problem with an organization like this is that they're constantly teaching their employees how to run an organization like this. By all accounts, they employed hundreds of workers. Only nine were convicted. Everybody doesn't want to talk about this, but these kids, they adapt and they become better at what they do. And it goes back to simple economics, supply and demand. There was always somebody willing to step into that void because uh, a lot of them had lost hope. In 1988, Detroit police averaged 26 arrests a day. In Cleveland, the arrest rate doubled in one year. Toledo, Ohio, averaged 200 arrests a month. 90% of them were crack-related. Lee County, Arkansas, like the rest of the nation, began arresting kids dealing crack. So that's what happened. The Chamber Brothers taught them well, and it's no different than any franchise. And instead of Burger King, you become McDonald's, or you become the new Wendy's. That's what happened. American Gangster contacted the city of Detroit, both the mayor's office and the police department, with requests to participate in this production. Both offices declined. Billy Joe and Larry no longer talk, but they're still competing. Each has written a book. BJ's is entitled Prodigy Hustler. Larry is still working on a title. The only advice I have for the black youth is to learn to love their own kind first. 1970 to 2003, I've only been free three years. This time, perhaps, I will die in prison. Hey, I don't trip. I just roll with the punches. <laughs>